evening. Welcome to the December 4th Board of Education meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move that we move, we meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, employees or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to perform an administrative function and to consult with counsel. I have a motion to go into closed session. I need a second. Second. Motion is second to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. We'll be back at 6 o'clock. Good evening. Welcome to the December 4th Board of Education meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move that we move, we meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, employees or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to perform an administrative function and to consult with counsel. I have a motion to go into closed session. I need a second. Second. Motion and second to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. We'll be back at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education December 4th meeting. If everyone could rise for the pledge, remain standing for about a few minutes in recognition of our troops overseas. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we begin the uh, formal part of the meeting, I just want to let everyone to know that Mrs. Harlow has resi resigned her position on the board effective November 30th of 2019. She has resigned uh, because she's relocated out of District 4 of Queen Anne's County, and by law she can no longer represent the citizens of District 4 on the Board of Ed. Uh, Mrs. Harlow served for three years on the board and was very involved in Queen Anne's County government issues for many years before her tenure here. Our board has greatly benefited from Mrs. Harlow's excellent historical knowledge on many issues affecting Queen Anne's County. This knowledge and her dedicated research, which she, research, she researched everything for us um, and a, a lot of information from the past, I really valued that. Um, and she had an excellent knowledge of many issues that affect the Queen Anne's County. And this knowledge and her research on many of the items that the board worked on in the past few years will be greatly missed. She diligently represented her constituents in all of her decision making and was a very valuable representative of Queen Anne's County in this very challenging role. Also, before we start um, our normal meeting, Per section 3-10A-03 of the Education Article to the Annotated Code of Maryland, the Queen Anne's County Board of Education shall elect a president and vice president at its first meeting in December. Board members, may I have a motion to proceed with the election for the office of board president and vice president? So moved. May I have a second? Second. A motion and a, by Ms., Mrs. Harper and a second by Mrs. Morset that we proceed with the election of officers. All in favor, Mrs. Wright, please record. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morset? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have four in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay. So are there any nominations for the Office of Board President? I would like to nominate Tammy Harper as our Board President. Do I have a second? Second. Are, are there any other? Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't need a second. Apologize. Are there any other nominations for the office board president? So the nomination for Mrs. Harper to be selected as board president was moved by Mrs. Morset. All in favor of selecting Mrs. Harper as board president, please respond by raising your hand. Motions passed. Congratulations, Mrs. Harper. 
I will now turn the meeting over to your new board president so she may proceed with the election of the Office of Board Vice President. Thank you. Appreciate that. Is this in, uh... Uh, may I have a motion? Oh, excuse me. Do I have any nominations for the Office of Vice President of the Board? I would like to nominate Mr. Smith. Yeah, I have a nomination for Mr. Smith. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Hearing none, I close the nominations. I'd like to have the vote on the nomination to elect Mr. Dick Smith as our Vice President of the Board of Education for Queen Anne's County. All those in favor, please raise your hand say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. Congratulations, Mr. Dick Smith. Okay, I'd like to make one more statement. Absolutely. I wanted to let everyone know that I appreciated the opportuni opportunity to serve you as the Queen Anne's County Board of Education President. I do plan to continue to serve as a valuable member of the board, and I look forward to working with Mrs. Harper and all the board members to help improve Queen Anne's County public school system to the benefit of all of our students. Thank you for having given me this opportunity. And thank you all very much. <laughs> very much. Thank you for your service, Captain Kelly. By the time you've done your tenure, you have been here nine years. You were appointed by uh, the governor at that time, O'Malley, mm -hmm. and then served two sessions, being reelected both times, and uh, couldn't be here without you both times here. So, um, and thank you to Mr. Smith and Mrs. Morissette for being here, and uh, my deepest condolences to uh, Mrs. Harlow leaving. She was a, a true asset and. And again, research was her thing. We absolutely, there were things that I didn't know, and thank God she was here to tell us. So uh, she will be missed. Um, uh, we have some housekeeping items. I need a motion from the floor to approve the agenda as it presented. So moved. I have a second. 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 Do I uh, have any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the uh, motion to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We have a mo approval of minutes from November 6th and November 20th, 2019 for open and closed sessions. Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. I have a second. Second. Do I have any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the Meeting minutes for November 6th and November 20th open and close. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Dr. Kane, we have recognition. We have recognition. Please join me up front. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is my distinct pleasure to recognize several employees and members of our community today. First, I'm gonna ask our sponsors for the Energizer Bunny to please come forward. Of course, the Energizer Bunny is an award given to a staff member or a volunteer who keeps on going. This award is sponsored by Bayview Financial through Chip Brittingham, Mr. Wayne Humphreys, and Mark Humphreys. Our recipient tonight is Miss Betsy Bear. <laughs> Miss Bear, please come forward. <laughs> All right. Miss Bear was nominated by uh, Jolene Smith, who is our supervisor. I know I just saw her. Oh, there she is, who's our supervisor for special education services. Miss Betsy Bear is the energizer bunny that never quits. As a speech and language pathologist, Ms. Bear serves as a lead speech pathologist for the special education department, an advocate for recruiting highly qualified related service providers, and a mentor to new speech pathologists in our county. Over the past year, Mrs. Bear has been responsible for the development and approval of professional development courses aligned with our district goals, which have afforded current speech pathologists an opportunity to gain continuing education units necessary for their license maintenance. Mrs. Bear is often found in the wee hours of the morning on her own time working to support students, staff, and our school system. 
We thank Ms. Bear for her endless energy, effort, and dedication to the staff and students of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> so who do you have with you? I have a lot of colleagues with me. Call them by name, make them come down. <laughs> I have my retired teacher friend, Joni Berwick. Come down. Karen Fields. Celia Mitchell, Mary Bordley, and Patty Delacuesta, and Art Pippo. All right, come on down. Can I also mention that she is the treasurer of the Queen Anne County Education Association? You absolutely may. She's there. I would just like to, to go on record this I did submit the paperwork but these nominations all the ones tonight from from myself um, actually came from fellow staff throughout the county that have made these recommendations and suggestions and accolades so really the kudos to, goes to you uh, from everyone congratulations <laughs> Our next award is the Spirit Award. And the Spirit Award is presented to an employee who personifies the spirit of education. Our award winner tonight is Ms. Lisa Clark from Mattapeak <laughs> Elementary School. Ms. Clark was also nominated by Ms. Jolene Smith. Ms. Clark demonstrates a willingness to go above and beyond for students. Let me make sure I get this right. Uh, Ms. Clark is a special educator at Mattapique Elementary School, serving second and third grade classrooms. Um, Mrs. Clark does not have a caseload of a few, but a caseload of many, as she embodies the idea that all means all, right? which also means that all students are the shared responsibility of both the special educator and the general educator. She provides endless support to students and staff within the school with a smile. We thank Ms. Clark for all her efforts to support the students of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And who do you have with you? I have my, oh, thank you. I have my husband, Steve, my daughter, Devin, you know, we're going to have you come on down. Uh, my principal, Jennifer Schreckengast, Sarah Pease, one of my co-teachers, Claire Kelly, my paraeducator who I could not survive without, and Mary Mahler, our amazing school counselor. All right, our next award is for the Shining Star. So Queen Anne's County Public Schools is extraordinarily fortunate in the quality and dedication of our employees. This award recognizes a Queen Anne's County Public Schools employee who shines. Our shining star tonight is Mr. Matthew Perry. Mr. Perry, come on down. Right. Mr. Perry serves as a coach for behavioral change and recreational progress as a behavior specialist for the special education department and as a basketball coach at Queen Anne's County High School. 
Mr. Perry embodies a shining star in our school system as his willingness to go above and beyond for students and staff place him at the top of the class. Several staff within the system have noted Mr. Perry's willingness to alter his schedule, to meet an immediate student need, or to provide support to students. Mr. Perry brings calm and understanding to situations that often start in a different way. We thank Mr. Perry for his continuous efforts and support for the staff and students of Queen Anne's County. Well done. And we're gonna ask you also who you have with you. I have my lovely wife, uh, Rebecca Perry, my son, Dash, and the newest addition, Arlo. Congratulations. And he's sleeping. Is this Arlo? Precious. I've been asking about him in heaven. How are you, sir? And our final, uh, last but certainly not least, our Difference Maker Award. Our Difference Maker Award is presented to someone who makes a difference in the life of staff and students. Our Difference Maker Award honoree is Mr. David Pratt. Come forward, Mr. Pratt. And he was nominated by Ms. Susan Walbert, who is our supervisor for a whole lot of things. Title I, English Language Learners, Migrant Program, uh, Missing One, Early Childhood. Should I continue? I'm good. All right. Uh, Mr. Pratt is a community member, a father, and a member of Team Dude. Team Dude, for those of you who do not know, is an acronym, an acronym for Dedicated Unstoppable Men Doing the Right Thing even when no one is watching. The program began at Sutlersville Elementary with the hopes of fathers and other male role models coming together and learning how to be a productive part of their child's educational experience. Mr. Pratt became a member and quickly progressed to an advocate and leader. He's become instrumental in expanding the club to other Title I schools beyond Sutlersville. Uh, Mr. Pratt is, a, is real in his approach, taking on all perspectives of being a father and a role model. Mr. Pratt shared that spending time with this group helps him to see things through the eyes of his daughter and provide her with the things she needs. We applaud him for his courageous actions, and thank you so much, Mr. Pratt. <laughs> Well, I brought all my daughters, uh, starting with Amelia, if you want to come up here, my wife Amy, my wife, I mean my uh, daughter Maddie, and last but not least, Cameron, I'm sorry, I told you she didn't want to come up here, but I told her. So, and then uh, my mother, uh, Carmen, and my stepfather, Skip, you guys can come on up too, you guys are my support group. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. Tom, of course. I wouldn't be able to do this without Tom and Susan. Come on up here. My, my bad. I'm so sorry. I'm going to read it first this time. Was it something we said? <laughs> Maryland basketball. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Notre Dame. All right. 
while they're filing out. Uh, we now have at uh, 4.01 board involvement. I would like to go ahead and go first. Good night, Mr. Pippo. Thank you. So during American Education Week of November 18th to the 22nd, uh, I attended Challenge Day at Centerville Middle, Stevensville Middle, and Mattapique Middle. Just stopped in for an hour or so, see how things were going. Um, I need to make a, give a big shout out to all the volunteers who took time off from their uh, work to uh, attend Challenge Day. They wonderful people in our community. Thank you to Rosa and C. Lloyd, who were the Challenge Day counselors. Wonderful. Uh, I got to talk to them at length. Wonderful people. A thank you to Matt Evans, who was there every single day. And, uh, you know, organizing, putting together. Um, thank you. I know you get paid to do this, but thank you. It was um, I, a lot of good came out of those, those days. And to Mrs. Uh, Linda Smith, who has always been a big supporter of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Um, big shout out to her. And, sorry? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Linda Austin. Did I call her Smith? Yes, I did. Sorry, Linda Austin. Um, I That same week, uh, visits to Bayside Elementary School, Ken Allen Elementary, Mattapeak Elementary, and Mattapeak Middle uh, with Mr. Pinder and Mr. Paluski. Um, got to see some great things going on in our schools. Talked about maintenance issues and talking with the principal, so I appreciate their time and allowing uh, me to um, bother them during their busy days. And that's uh, all I did. How about you, Captain Kelly? Um, I have visited Kennard uh, Elementary, Mattapeak Elementary, Mattapeak Middle, and uh, Centerville Elementary Schools. We're doing some visits by the board members to the schools. It's great to get out there and look at the programs and look at what we're um, trying to help them with. And they are just fabulous out there. It's just fabulous to see. Um, and and they're really getting to the students. The students, they, they, don't, they don't actually pick a room to go into. They, we just kind of wander around and it, the principals are willing to show us everything. So I know none of it's staged. They're just genuinely happy, happy kids in just about every one of these um, schools. Um, the other thing I did is I did go to the um, May legislative meeting and one thing we did was vote on the 2020 legislative positions um, and I'll just read the four key ones they're working on. Like I mentioned last meeting, Kerwin is the big issue we're all trying to deal with and, um, and really understand and to push this year. Um, the first thing is that we always do um, continued governance autonomy for local schools and, and local boards of education. And we always oppose unfunded mandates. That's one of the main ones we always support um, in legislative initiatives. Next one is supporting full state funding for the Maryland Outstanding Public Schools, specifically seeking passage of the Kerwin Commission legislation to update and enhance constitutional adequacy and equity of state and local funding. That's the big Kerwin one that we'll be pushing this year. Also, the support for increased state funding for school construction and renovation product projects. And the fourth one is support for sustained and increased local government investments in education. And specifically, MABE is looking for passage of the Kerwin Commission legislation that includes mandated increases in both state and local funding. So those are the initiatives that we have voted on, the 24 uh, jurisdiction or 24 districts of, of uh, in other words, the 24 local school boards. Um, and we want to support those and MABE will be doing the lobbying and in the state legislature this year with those emphasis. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Um, I'd like to reiterate on these school visitations. I want to thank the executive team, the, Dr. Kane, and people that have taken us around there. It's very impressive to see these schools <coughs> and the, the principals and the teachers. It's just, you, you, it, it makes it worthwhile being up here when you see what these kids are doing and how our schools operate. I mean, we're fortunate. They're in good shape. They, they're in a good atmosphere there, and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with that. Uh, and in saying that, we've had a little bit of recent budget here and budget information to us, and that's going to be coming up next January, February, and March. And we're very fortunate because we're a small school system, but there's a lot of challenges because we're a small school system that the costs aren't shared over as much. So it's, it's tough, and uh, we're going to do the best we can. Anybody has any input, and I know everybody's got their own little priorities, talk to the board members or Dr. Kane or whoever you feel comfortable with because we want to do what's best for Queen Anne's County, what's right for Queen Anne's County. 
Uh, we're not Anne Arundel, we're not a 30,000 school system, but we're, we're a good school system. And I'm very impressed with what we do and proud of what we've done. I'm a product, I think, along with another board member of Queen Anne's County. So it's, it's a good system and we're all in this together. That's all I can say. Thank you. Mrs. Morissette. Um, I, too, have done some school visits with Mr. Pender to um, Centerville Elementary and Kennard. Just as impressed as you all, and what I took from it is how welcoming and homey our schools feel. So to come into that warm atmosphere every day for our students, that's, that's the biggest thing. They, they feel at home. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kane. Thank you. First, I'd like to offer my congratulations to Ms. Harper and to Mr. Smith for your new um, roles as officers for the school board. Congratulations to you both. Um, so busy month, busy month, of course. We started the month, or I started the month, with the M&S, Maryland Negotiation Services um, Conference, and, and that was enlightening. Uh, certainly, I had uh, Captain Kelly was there as well. And we got a lot of information, information on negotiations, cases that are going on right now. So that was great. Uh, we had the Minority Achievement Committee. I sit on that for Chesapeake College in the beginning of the month. We certainly had several monitoring visits at uh, Churchill Elementary. We had Arise. We had Bayside, Centerville Elementary, um, Sudlersville Elementary, Queen Anne's County High School, Kent Island High School. So we've been making the rounds. And it's December now, but we even we had uh, one this morning at uh, Mattapeak Middle School. So lots of good things happening in our school system. And in, in where there are areas that are in need of improvement, I'd just like to thank our schools, our leadership teams, our teachers for being receptive to our feedback. And sometimes when we go in, we can see the progress that's been made since the last time we were there for that type of a visit. So they're working hard, and I'd just like to give kudos to them because they really are making lots of effort, and the improvement is certainly showing in most places. Um, Bayside Elementary School, we have the Veterans Day program. Um, and uh, I was able to have lunch with some of our Teacher of the Year sponsors, Stephen Pector from Power School and Ryan and Logan Grossman from Valak. Uh, I was at the Destined to Rise um, perform at the uh, Todd Performing Arts Center. That's a group of girls who are working on building their leadership skills. And we had that at Chesapeake College, so that was great. Later in the month, uh, we, cert we had um, I met with or I joined in the Equal Opportunity Schools. You hear me talk about Equal Opportunity Schools. So Queen Anne's County High School had theirs later in the month, and I was able to join in for part of that. And of course, I'd like to mention the town hall on Kerwin that MSEA, the Teachers Association, had that was held at Chesapeake, I mean, at uh, Centerville Middle School. We had on that same day the legislative day for superintendents in Annapolis, and we were able to talk to several lawmakers there, which was good information about Kerwin. Um, and uh, certainly we had the commissioners meeting. I was there with uh, Mr. Pender and Mr. Paluski and Mr. Fister, and it was great. S attended another one, and we had Ms. Pullen there. She was there also for that one, but she was also there representing um, as a member of the Character Counts, because as you know, last year Ms. Pullen was the Character Counts uh, mentor or volunteer of the year. So. Congratulations once again. Busy month. We've got more to do and excited about it. Can't wait for uh, all the exciting things that are happening for the month of December in our schools. Thank you very much. Mr. Kaluski. Thank you. Equally congratulations, both students, Ms. Harper, uh, Ms. Smith, for your, uh, your leadership. Um, I'll be very brief. Obviously, attend many of the things that Dr. Kane uh, attends as well. Certainly want to highlight uh, the work that our schools are doing. We finished up our site visits. Uh, we'll probably prepare a report for the board sometime in January, give you a little bit of uh, the strengths, things that, are, are, that we see from our vantage point as district leaders that are going well, and certainly some areas that we continue to work on. So uh, we'll be in the midst of preparing that. Um, I also wanted to highlight that right before uh, the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, we have our annual articulation meeting. So uh, what's probably hard to believe is that we've been four months into school. We're already beginning to plan for 2021. So our annual articulation meetings, we bring all of our middle school principals, our high school principals, school counselors. We talk about changes for the upcoming school year and that specifically that transition from eighth grade into ninth grade and any changes. So uh, I always like to put that out in the forefront is even though we start a school year, we're already planning for the next one. Uh, lastly, uh, this week, Dr. Kane and I had the opportunity 
um, to go to reception uh, for the new economic development um, director, Ms. Is Heather uh, Tanelli. So we had an opportunity to go to Fisherman's on Monday and, uh, and welcome her uh, to her new role. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, kudos to Heather Tanelli, who I know personally. And, uh, Captain Kelly and I worked with her husband on the board for four years. So, um, well, two, you four, me too. So it was, it's wonderful to have her on board with the county. Uh, citizen participation. Oh, gosh, I apologize. <laughs> Shannon, please. Okay. Ms. Phillips for our Queen Anne's County High School. Okay, so in November, winter sports started, which is very exciting. I've myself been to two basketball scrimmages. I know wrestling had their green and gold duel, and indoor track has their first meet tomorrow, which is very exciting. And also, before we went on Thanksgiving break, our school held two food drives. One was done by our Strength and Honor Club, and the other was an annual one that the Future Business Leaders of America do. And I know through that one, over 1,000 cans were earned, so that's really mm. good. Awesome. And then tomorrow night's actually the band concert, which I'm very excited for. We'll see jazz band, symphonic band, concert band, and marching band, which I know everyone's worked very hard on. And then Friday, is also very exciting, is going to be the Centerville Christmas Parade. I know Spectrum Club will have a float there, Interact Club, um, marching band will be performing in that, so that's exciting. The dance concert isn't till the 11th, and then I think now everyone's just counting down for winter break. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have a float as well, so you'll see oh, us yeah, there. Oh, yeah, there you yeah. go. Go ahead, Mary. Okay, now I'll read. Uh, um, Skylar Pedra Pedraza is not here. She's rehearsing for the Nutcracker, so that was definitely important. Uh, so she did send her report in. I just want to read it. Winter sports season is in full swing, and teams are having a great start. Just last night in, at the Ken Island High School Auditorium, the choir had an excellent winter concert. Then next week, our dance and athletic movement classes and dance company will take the stage in their winter dance showcase on December 11th at 7. Finally, for our arts, the band will hold their winter concert on the 18th, also at 7. Also on the 18th, the National Honor Society is holding a college and cookies event after school for past members now in college to educate and answer questions on college for the seniors. This quarter is moving quickly. On the 16th, student quarter two interim reports will be sent out. And finally, before we leave for break, she says on the 20th, our SADD SAD Club will be holding their annual holiday sweater competition during all lunch shifts. So that is a report from Ken Island from Ms. Schuyler. Uh, citizen participation, would you read that? Thank you. We ask all spe speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their phone number and address. Comments are limited to three minutes in length. No longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing, any longer than three minutes. Organizations and municipalities, elected officials, five minutes, and individuals, three minutes. Questions or statements to the board need to relate to a recent agenda item, an item that is expected to hear, appear in the future, or as a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper venue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially the matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through available channels. Citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer period. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but we ask as a courtesy to the board and to the citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens or call or name calling when you're offering your critique. We have one name on the list, Richard McNeil. I wasn't sitting all the way in the back, that's what the back left, the front left. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, congratulations to the new leaders and uh, Captain Kelly. Thank you for your leadership and look forward to your continuation as a as a board member. 
Uh, Mr. Smith, are you getting the retired educators newsletter? Okay, just wanted to make sure, and I think everybody else is also. But I wasn't sure we had you on the list, so thank you very much. Um, I was attended a legislative update also. It seems like the month of November is that time when they're doing that, and um, obviously got an update from the retired group in terms of legislative issues that might affect um, pension. Uh, one of the things that came up was the concern of some of the mandates that are coming back to the local school districts, such as Queen Anne's County, that maybe are not fully funded, which could maybe impact our uh, the board's support of our health package. Um, we thank you so much for what you do. I know that Queen Anne's County does a lot more in their health for the retirees than a lot of other school districts. And um, our concern, obviously, is we thank you and hope that as you go through the budget process that you can maintain that at the same level. Um, I know that some of the mandates, or at least I'm assuming that some of these mandates aren't going to take place until two years out or three years out as the Kerwin report has its run, whatever happens on that. And it's our, my understanding also from our report that the Kerwin report monies is not necessarily going to fund all the mandates that it's also asking for. Now, I could be misinformed on that, but just my concern on that. Um, 20 years ago, uh, you probably weren't even born. If you re all remember, we were concerned about the Y2K bug uh, of <laughs> computers shifting over. Um, I was in conversation earlier this week. We were talking about that. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years since we turned into the 21st century, and here we are 20 years in almost. I don't think we have to worry about the Y2K bug coming up in January 1st, but just wanted to remind everybody we made it through that. Um, also want to uh, just mention that um, I'm glad that Mr. Bell is highlighting our uh, student artists and, and um, and, and, you know, we, we have some quality folks in dance and, and art and music and so forth. And I just appreciate reading in the paper how he is highlighting that. So, Dr. Kane, if you could pass that on, I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, it really is nice to see uh, some students being recognized for the talent that they, that they have and, and show. Um, it's just great. Um, and I know that, um, you know, for me, that this, this is a big time of Thanksgiving. We just had Thanksgiving last weekend. Um, just want to say thanks to the board members for all the work you do. Thanks to Dr. Kane and Mr. Paluski for leadership in our school system. A big thanks to the leadership in our buildings um, with the teachers and, and the whole staff. You know, it's just... Uh, it's been my experience that, you know, you pat somebody on the back and that goes a long way. And a lot of times we, in, as educators, we encourage students to do well and pat them on the back. But it's not always that we pat our folks who are out there doing their job. And just want to say thanks to all of them in this, in this time of the year on that aspect. Um, Again, as, as you get into the, into the budget, uh, appreciate what you have done for the retirees. And uh, we have a luncheon coming up next Tuesday, and I, I know a couple of the board members will be there looking forward to that. And uh, if I don't see everybody in between now and then, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. So, anyone else would like to speak? And in that vein of Thanksgiving and uh, you know, the holiday and it being the end of a fiscal year, I just want to give a, th a special thanks to all of our sponsors, all of the community members that come out year after year uh, to support Queen Anne's County Public Schools, our students, our staff. There's just too many to name. I mean, Mr. Chip's been sitting here giving out the uh, Energizers of Boney for I can't even tell you how many years. So. You know, you know who you are. Thank you all very, very much for for what you have done and helping us help our students and our community. Um, can't be more grateful and and appreciative of everybody. Um, down to presentations. Uh, Six point oh one teacher principal evaluation data. Data. Mrs. Forbes. Yep. So Ms. Forbes is going to come forward and share some 
information with regard to our teacher and principal evaluation. She's done a great job with this. Thank you, Ms. Forbes. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Harper, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Kane. It's a pleasure to be here again tonight um, and to present to you tonight on the teacher and principal evaluations. So tonight I'm going to review the components of the comprehensive evaluation, summarize the 2018-19 data from those evaluations, and then become familiar um, just with the, what the evaluation ratings means for the system. And so every year, teachers and principals receive a comprehensive evaluation. For both uh, teachers and principals, it's based equally 50-50 on professional practice and also on student growth. And based on those calculations, um, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, teachers and principals are identified as ineffective, developing, effective, or highly effective. So teachers who are due for recertification receive a new professional practice evaluation. Um, if a teacher is tenured, um, they are actually able, and, and they received an effective or highly effective rating, they are able to carry over that rating if they so choose um, for two years, um, or they can request a new uh, evaluation if they would like. The rating of developing is only used typically for non-tenured teachers or sometimes in really rare circumstances for a tenured teacher who may have an extenuating circumstance. And the professional practice domains are um, based on the Danielson framework for teaching, which is also the recommended model by the state. And uh, those domains are planning and preparation, instruction, instruction and assessment, classroom environment, and professional responsibilities. For our principals, they receive that professional practice valuation every year. Um, and similarly, the rating of developing can be used for new, uh, new principals. Uh, however, in 2018-19, it is a new, uh, the professional practice categories changed. Uh, we used to have four, and now we have 10. And you can see them um, all captured up there in the rubric. And again, this is also the recommended state model. And it's the professional standards for education leaders rubric. <clears throat> and it covers just a whole scope um, of, of different areas, you know, from vision and mission, equity, um, school personnel, school improvement, of course, curriculum instruction and assessment, operations, um, just the large, large scope that our, our principals really do every day. So the other component of the evaluation for teachers is based on student growth. So teachers uh, collaboratively um, with their building administrator, they develop student learning objectives. Um, you might hear the word slow, um, and so uh, that you'll hear that used quite a bit. And so they base that on two different approved measures. And for some of our high school teachers, if they teach those high school assessment courses that are required for graduation, government, or the science test, the MISA, um, that one of those student learning objective needs to be linked to that for student performance. So again, they really look at the needs of their students, they look at data, they meet with their principals, they meet with their evaluators and come to a mutual agreement about um, what those student learning objectives will be for that part of their evaluation. Similarly, principals, um, however, they develop three and they work collaboratively with their supervisors as well. And they're encouraged to base at least two of those on improving student group performance. Some of our teachers also focus on student group performance, um, but, and our principals do as well. So, <clears throat> oh, it looks like my, my chart got a, little, it got a little moved over. I apologize for that. Um, sometimes when we go from PowerPoint to, uh, to Google Slides, it goes, or goes back and forth. Um, but I will capture what it says for you. So I have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Student group performance, is that specialized groups like Could be. Mm -hmm. ELA and I just wonder what the definition of that yeah, is. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So our student groups um, are the state reported student group categories. Um, typically it's a student group that there would be 10 or more students in and, and it's also part of our state accountability. So it could be students with disabilities, um, students who uh, redu receive free and reduced lunch, student groups based on race and ethnicity, um, you know, or the service category. Um, so again, like I mentioned, the evaluation is based 
50-50 on professional practice and also on the student growth. Um, and so the only part that kind of disappeared there was just um, how the student learning objectives are scored. So if a teacher fully attains that goal that they set, they receive six points. If they receive partial attainment, they receive four points. And insufficient attainment is two points. And so um, there's a total of 12 altogether. And the practi uh, professional practice scoring, highly effective, receives a rating of three. Effective is two and developing, um, again, which is only considered for typically a non-tenured new teacher is one. And then those points are taken and they're compiled. And then the overall rating, which is seen in the table, is um, the overall comprehensive evaluation rating or the comprehensive score. And then similarly for principals, um, there's a much bigger breakdown since the principals have those 10 professional practices. Um, in order, they can receive up to 1.2 points per practice, or 5%. And for their student growth, those student learning objectives, um, they can receive four points per, um, per objective. And then again, those are compiled together for that comprehensive um, evaluation score. And this is uh, a summary of how the, when we looked at all of our teacher evaluations from 2018-19, um, the total percentages that fell into each category. This represents 515 teacher evaluations. And as you can see, um, the large majority fell into the effective and highly effective category. It was actually um, looked up to 99.42%. Um, on the professional practice portion. And then when combined with the student learning objectives for that comprehensive evaluation, it slightly dipped just a touch to 97.86%, but for the most part, the student learning objectives um, had positive impacts. So 141 teacher evaluations were positively impacted once you incorporated those student learning objectives. So again, those data points based on the goals that they mutually developed. Um, <clears throat> so it increased one evaluation from ineffective to effective. It moved one up from developing to effective and increased 139 from effective to highly effective. So again, if we were to look at where they started on professional practice for the most part. Um, for those 141 evaluations, it increased them. However, there were 31 teacher evaluations that it had a negative effect on. Nine were decreased. Um, they received an effective on the professional practice, um, and, it, and it moved to developing or ineffective. And 22 evaluations moved from highly effective to effective. So we have only 172 teachers that were evaluated? Oh no, these, I'm sorry, these were the ones that had a, that had a change, yeah, oh, okay. due to the student learning objectives, but this represents altogether 515. 515 That's a great question. Teachers, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and so those other teachers, if we took away that 174, um, their professional practice rating was the same as the comprehensive, so the student learning objectives did not increase it, nor did um, they decrease that score. <laughs> And our principals, 100% um, of our principals were rated uh, effective on the professional <coughs> practice portion, which again were those 10 different areas. Um, and in, there was just one case um, that it, uh, principal received, um, it, it raised it up one level. And you can see that in the, in the bottom line that it went from effective to highly effective and no principals were negatively impacted by the student learning objectives which most likely tells us they're meeting those learning objectives, so. And so I think um, it just, uh, overall, um, just in conclusion, I think it's a lot of really positive data that, you know, our folks who are supervising, our teachers, our principals, academic deans, supervisors, assistant principals are really finding that teachers are effective and highly effective, and that's great data to share, um, and similarly for our principals. So, and I welcome any questions that you may have. The, I mean, the numbers look excellent. I have no, how, how would a question, if I had a question five years ago compared to today? I mean, when you say things changed, with principals in 2018, 19, mm -hmm. you know, of course, some of these numbers, when you're at 100 percent, you better than you ever were. Because, but you know, when I look at them, are we five years ago compared to today? We could certainly, I could pull that for you. I mean, is, I mean, is there enough data to be relevant, or we change the rules too much? 
to do that. I don't think teachers have changed that much, and, and I they change the standards. That's the one thing. They they have, and and with the shift to the Common Core state standards back clear back in 2010, part of the reform effort with changing to new standards and changing to new assessments was the fact that we recognized that there was some work that had to be done in looking at teacher evaluations as well as principal evaluations because we know that teachers have a direct impact on student achievement and principals have a direct impact on teacher behavior. So with that came the, the new evaluation system in, in which we have today. Um, but I think you know, when you look at the evaluation process, what it is really forced is a narrowing of focus on achievement gaps within our schools and within our individual classrooms. And it's really focused that conversation between the principal and the teacher on meeting the individual needs of all students. And, you know, we've been looking at data for a long time, but I think with this process has really narrowed the focus and has narrowed the scope. With Ms. Forbes, is one of the things that she had mentioned, we talked about the, the recent change from the four really domains of each principal now that are in 10 domains, that is, that is new. There are things that are within the new domains. We'll use school improvement as an example. Principals have been engaged in school improvement for years. Now it's more of a focused indicator as, as far as their evaluation is concerned. Um, the work that's tied around equity, that is now an indicator within. So it's all of this is really to focus on the gaps that is still exist. We're doing well overall, and the superintendent talks about this all the time. In our aggregate scores across our district, we look pretty good. But once you peel that underneath, there are still some significant gaps among student groups. This whole process is to get to that and to be able to look at growth of students over time. And, and that's happening, um, and, th and that's a positive thing um, that exists across our system. There's still work to do. Um, you know, uh, most recently, you know, the Maryland report card just came out um, recently. You saw our strategic goal one. Uh, Mr. Pender, they'll be, you know, on goal two today. There's still some gaps. Um, so we still continue. This is one data point that we look at among multiple, uh, but it's looking at all of those collectively together um, strategically to align this work on improving teaching and learning. Can I ask maybe to make it simpler for me? We got we got these numbers here today. I just like to see you know where we were five years ago and where we are today. And you know I know things are changing, more required. We're trying to get achievement gaps and all that stuff together. And I, I'm a certain believer when the tide comes in, all boats rise. Sure. But are we making sure they all rise, you know, together? And you know, are we doing a you know, I mean, we're a lot, we're just more efficient than we were five years ago. And that's just sometimes hard when I see these numbers, I don't have anything to compare them to. I mean, in baseball, I can see you're hitting 300, but you change a pitcher's mound back sure. five feet or six feet higher, those numbers are all screwed mm -hmm. up. Sure. I ask, who does the teacher evaluations? The teacher evaluation is done by the principal. Okay, the principals and, and anybody from the exec team help out? Or N not on a just... teacher evaluation, it's just purely the principal. And then, ha and then, how about the principal evaluations? Who does that? Uh, that involves the superintendent, myself, Ms. Pauls. Okay. Yeah, I never knew. I sure. Who sure. did what? Okay. That's a lot of work from principals. Each building has, you know, forty teachers or plus. And if you have high school, do you have you have yeah. more? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. even more. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Thank you, Mrs. Forbes. Yes, Thanks very much. You. Happy holidays. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Forbes. Uh, strategic goal, plan goal two, safety and security, Mr. Evans and Mr. Pender. Good evening, President Harper, Vice President Smith, Dr. Kane, board members. Good evening. For the record, uh, my name is Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. I'm Matt Evans, Supervisor of Student Support Services. And you're probably wondering why the two of us are up here since we oversee totally different areas. Um, and it's a unique spectrum of school safety. Um, I kind of handle the, the hard issues. Uh, when I say hard, like the concrete, the structure of the building. 
um, work with the SROs, the safety plans. Mr. Evans handles the student aspect of it. So we overlap quite a bit and work well together. Um, and ha happy to have him in this position uh, for this year. I just want to go on record and say that for well, you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, there are five strategic um, plan goals. And with in month of October, October, I'm sorry, learning accountability and uh, results uh, was presented. This month, we're going to focus on safe schools. And then you will followed up by operational effectiveness, human capital. And the fifth goal will be um, community partnerships. And if, as you heard um, before from Mr. Paluski, you know, the innovation center teams were developing these goal, the goals, the five goals that we have right now. So uh, the purpose of this, I just want to give an overview of, uh, of the uh, goal two, safe schools, provide an overview of, it, as far as, as my piece is, is the uh, discipline data and the attendance data, uh, and also discuss the prevention and intervention initiatives that uh, both school-based and as a system that, that are taking place in Queens County Public Schools. Uh, and, and then just want to talk about those trends and patterns regarding student discipline and attendance and to kind of get an understanding of how those are related and how it impacts school climate. With the overview, um, what we want to do is go through the different categories, and I apologize. It should be a numeric order, one, two, three. I don't know why that didn't um, transfer over there. But all schools are safe and caring environments to promote a positive school culture, digital learning, and citizenship, and supporting develop, developing healthy, responsible students. We were trying to gather information that is measurable, something that we can really take a look at. And, you know, are we increasing or decreasing, like Mr. Smith was just asking about with the, uh, the evaluations and where we are. Um, our goal is to have 100% of the schools and office complexes with, uh, we'll have emergency <coughs> plans that are complete. Um, number two, 100% of schools will meet system requirements for emergency plan drills. Number three, 100% of employee unit group members will be trained for an active assailant. And number four, 100% uh, of health and safety violations per site will be corrected. And these are meant to be uh, in compliance by the end of the 2021 school year. So number five would be 99% of students <coughs> will avoid committing a physical assault. 98% uh, uh, of elementary, middle, and high school students will adhere to school policies involving tobacco, alcohol, and drugs while in school. 97% of all students will avoid committing a discipline infraction that leads to an out-of-school suspension. 100% uh, of elementary schools will maintain a 95% or higher attendance <coughs> rate. 100% of secondary schools will maintain a 94% or higher attendance rate. And 96% of all students will be identified as not chronically absent. And I can explain more of that in a bit. Looking at the current data, we went back to 2016-17 uh, and 17-18 and 2018-19 to see where we were with our emergency plans and were they being completed in a timely fashion and updated. As you can see, we have met that every year. Um, I would like to say we just switched over to a uh, web-based digital format where it's not myself and others running around with little thumb drives trying to make sure everything is updated. I can actually go online and monitor the changes that are made and make sure each area is checked off. Um, along with that, there is a um, printout of the school on there and you can click on every classroom that is on that school map and it will show you at least two pictures of that classroom. Um, with that being said, it also has the cameras on there that you can also click on. Um, very impressive program that we, like I said, we just switched over to it, and uh, we'll see uh, better transparency with this. And also, it'll allow, just with a single click, for me to share that information with law enforcement and DES and volunteer fire companies. Right now, you know, it takes us longer to correct the plans, you know, doing it the way we were doing it. So. That, that's a great accomplishment for, for our system moving that move, moving forward with that. 100% okay. um, of the schools will meet system requirements for emergency plan drills. So right now, MSDE requires you to do a lockdown drill, shelter in place, evacuation, reverse evacuation, um, tornado, um, severe weather, and an earthquake. 
really out of those, we really we focus on them all, but you really want to focus on the lockdown um, and evacuation type, because basically run, hide, fight type of scenario. Um, with our new program, we can also track all that information, turn that into MSDE. Principals can update it instead of having the paper trail that sometimes gets lost. Um, the principals each have a laptop now with the system loaded on it, designed just for that, so they can take it with them and update, make notes as the drills go on. We do have um, law enforcement, the Sheriff's Department, Centerville PD, DES that show up to our drills to critique and offer you know, their feedback because you know, having a third party to see something that that's their profession, you know, we may be missing something. Mr. Pender, what's yes, reverse evacuation? Reverse evacuation is say you're outside at recess or you're outside at phys ed and maybe you have somebody has escaped from uh, the jail or detention center and you need to want to get the students back into the school. Um, so we practice that at the same time. Um, that's a good question. Um, number three, 100% of employee unit group members will be trained for an active assailant. This is one that we realized that we were, were not meeting. Um, and I'll say two years ago, I was meeting with a group um, of substitutes about something. And hey, you know, you trained the teachers, you trained, you know, the faculty, but basically we're not there when that's going on. So if you look at 2016 and up to 2018, we were only meeting about 50% of our employee base to train them. Last year, we, uh, made sure we got the maintenance. We had individual training for the maintenance custodians. We had one for bus drivers. We had one for secretaries. You know, how are you gonna answer the phone when there's a bomb threat that occurs? Um, we really stepped our game up. If you look at it, it is not at 100% because we are missing those five hour paras. Um, and with the new program that I was talking about, we can now do the, all the modules online. So say we're hiring um, a custodian tomorrow. You know, we did all the training at the beginning of school year. He or she's missing what we're doing. Now with the online training and those modules, you'll be able to do the active assailant, you'll be able to do the uh, stop the bleeding, those types of things. And we can actually track the progress of where each employee is. Because it took a lot last year to get everybody, you know, at one location for training. So. I think this is a more um, thorough process and it's gonna be where we're not missing um, as many individuals throughout the year. And we always talk about security, but the other part of it is the health and safety violations. Um, you know, we have the uh, health department that comes in, inspects the kitchens. We have uh, MABE, our insurance provider. We have the inspections for the boilers, bleachers, um, elevator inspections. So we have about six or seven altogether. And about three years ago, I kind of noticed, hey, I don't think we're meeting all of them. So they, each person turns those into me each year or each um, month when they're done. And I personally go through them to check off on them. And then all of our, um, where we've been cited, they all have a web desk created, ticket created for them so that I can actually track it and make sure that we're getting those, those done. Um, if you look at, we're not quite at, 99% uh, last year. Some of those were cosmetic things for the bleachers. It was nothing structural, but just basically a kick plate that they are coming back now and, uh, and fixing. So when we talk about safe schools, again, it's just not security. It's also the self, uh, safe, um, as safety aspects of it. Uh, regarding uh, goal number five, 99% of students will avoid committing a physical assault. Really, that data's been been pretty flat over the past three years. We're, we're currently meeting that, and again, and the goal is to beat 99 percent at the end of uh, the 2021 school year. So that hasn't changed much. We're feeling good that we're you know hadn't moved significantly at all, and we're in compliance. Uh, 98 percent of elementary, middle, and high school students would adhere to school policies involving tobacco, alcohol, and drugs while in school. Again, we are. Um, uh, meeting that requirement in fact that uh, you were at 99.5 last school year uh so again in in good shape uh, with that but again the, the data is pretty flat it hasn't changed much over the past three years can i ask you how you how it, it, is this um 
how do you get this kind of data? Because that's not what I'm hearing at all. So, and, and that, that is a good question. So it, it goes by one, an individual student. So if, if an individual student is caught with, let's say, vaping, um, that, that counts. But if he's caught two or three more times, that doesn't go into that data. It's, it's. So, if, so you're you're multiple. So you're only offenders. catching one or two kids at a time. For I mean, if I offenders. if if I'm seeing that or a multiple offense, but I'm still at ninety nine point five five percent, that means they're really good at hiding it. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I just from a I, I'm out. I mean, I'm, I know, I'm out here this looking at this. This is just multiple offenders. This only reflects multiple. No, no. So one. this it reflects all students. Um, if a student's caught violating one of these uh, offenses then that they, and then they're called again it doesn't you know go yeah, it's in not as, a second as, offense. as another it's, offense it's just one person right so say this is three so 99 people. like last year 99 percent of our students were adhering to those policies as per the data that was pulled from power school i'm not saying that's wrong okay that's hard for me to believe yeah and, me too. And, uh, <clears throat> so i'm i'm thinking what you were saying is on the right track these are students who received an infraction. They were caught. They right. were right. right. So we know that right. students are doing things. Right. But if they aren't caught doing that, then we yeah, wouldn't have that. It's not reflective. Data. Exactly. Right. 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 Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a valid point because yes, it is an epidemic. Certainly, the the vaping and yeah. the increase with that, um, and and you even see that a little bit um, from seventeen eighteen to to last year. But um, again, yes, it's the actual infraction. Okay. Thank I, you probably will phrase this wrong. But are we looking for them or are we trying not to look And that, that's a good question too. No, I I think at the high schools, yes. Um, but it's it's difficult too. I mean there's you know, it's even like years ago with the cell phone policy, it's not that they're avoiding it, but sometimes it's difficult because there's a lot of it going on. Now I I can tell you that um, But if you say a lot of it's going on and then I see ninety nine percent or ninety eight percent I mean I that, that again the hard to you've got four it's, or five it's not, it's, students it's it, hard to it's catch it's not them. like it was when with cigarettes you know smoking in the bathroom and you could smell it and it's very clear and right. you have a camera who just went in there and who went out it's, you know there's not an odor there's i mean and we do we hear it from the students and the reports and the things that are going on but it's not it's not as clear right. and nobody's going in the bathroom obviously you can't smell it yeah i'm not yeah, sure it's it. a tough one I have a hard time thinking that's right. Do they, are, are all of them not reported on power if they're, school? It, they absolutely should be. If, they, if they're if they called, it's an infraction. I mean, it, I, it's it's against the school rules and that would go in as a, as a major discipline referral. I will say that used to be also um, a referral to DJS, but now the laws change as of October 1st where it, it's not right. a referable offense, but it's still, uh, uh, now, alcohol and drugs are yes just yeah. not the vaping correct do we have the sheriff or the police come in and do a walk around with a dog in the parking lot once in a while up maybe from down the halls yes we, we have done that in the past we try to do it about two times a year um and not much so much to catch somebody it's just deterrent or deterrent sure um we do do that um it's it's harder in the spring to do because of all the testing and trying not to interrupt everything. Right. Um, but we have, we did it last year, I believe in the fall, um, in the spring, trying to get, locate the dogs um, and the agencies to help assist us. Um, Maryland State Police will not assist with any of that. So basically we're relying on the Sheriff's Department and Centerville PD um, to do that. But we, we do often have those, yes. I mean, intervention, the quicker we can get this stopped at an early age to me, it's going to save some major issues for those students mm -hmm. later on in life. If, you know, and we, I mean, I just hear, I just hear it's a problem. I don't know it. I just hear it. There is, and it's, it's nationwide. And it might, it, yeah, right. It's not unique to Queen Anne's County. And, and we do have a, a program called Life Skills that we have throughout the, the middle school grades that really, it's not totally focused on uh, tobacco and alcohol, but it's against risky behaviors, you know, kind of educating students about when they're making these decisions early on and then the consequences that they can have. But a lot of it is aligned to this sort of thing. And we have had the Sheriff's Department come in to uh, ANS to go over different things with vaping um, and how it is tough with the THC in there and you're not smelling it and what's different uh, things to look for. Um, 
that's a hard area. Mm-hmm. I mean, to accomplish. I mean, enough, I mean, I, yeah. you know, we're educators, but it's a society today just has a big issue with, to me, drugs. Well, and, and, and it legalizes some of it, which makes it worse. Right. Well, the vaping issue is concerning because we really were at a point where you know students weren't smoking, and now we have uh, this increase of students that are addicted to nicotine again. And that's that's a terrible addiction. Mm-hmm. So it's and dying from it. Right. Yes. Quicker than cigarettes. Right. You look at all the lung infections that mm-hmm. are going on mm-hmm. across the country, mm-hmm. and you know cigarettes. It took them a couple of years to have a lung infection. Now they're getting it a lot quicker. And they're not even sure exactly what what's causing it. Right. Them. Thank you. Sorry. No, no problem. Well, I have a question. Mm-hmm. Um, just because your data is at sitting in these high marks, why aren't your goals 100% on all of these? I can look into that and get back to you. But, um, ultimately, I knew that, that it was at the end of the 2021 20, school year, looking at 98, 99%. So if they're fi- it's 2021 is the end of this yes. strategic plan. So oh. there will be a reset okay. at the 2020 after this plan is done. Okay. Yeah. And I did want to say also that students, yes, they certainly do participate in the life skills program, but in health class you realize that they do get information and they learn about the effects of snow- smoking, tobacco, alcohol, all that. Um, and, of course, Kathy Wright has her program where when students are um, – you know, caught using any of these substances, they do have to go through a, a smoking cessation or a tobacco cessation program. So you were asking about intervention. Mm-hmm. So that relates to that. I, I just wanted to add one thing too, just just to clarify, because we were just doing a couple site visits at both of our high schools and, and we're looking at their their data and, and both of us can assure you, uh, they do everything they can. They'll get tips from students. I mean, they are all over their schools, you know, trying to make sure that they're as safe as possible. So I just I just wanted to clarify that, that, you know, our administrators do a phenomenal job, especially at our high schools, uh, which is where, you know, predominantly where, where most of this activity occurs, um, do just a tremendous job, you know, trying to, you know, if, if somebody's violating a, a school policy, um, that they're there to intervene to make sure everybody else is safe. Well, where I'm hearing it is from just the middle schools. I have middle school parents telling me how their students are coming home and saying this one, that one, you know, um, you know, they're vaping down into their sweatshirts. That's why you can't see it. So if we, if we have such a, a problem at the middle school, man, I would like to see that get corrected as fast as possible. Yeah, These we, kids are dying. Yeah, we, we, we are right there with you. Certainly we don't disagree on that. We were just asking, um, we were at a school visit today, a monitoring visit, and specifically <laughs> asked about vaping. It was a middle school. And they had not had infractions this year at all. I was with, I had my student advisory yesterday, my uh, staff and my parent advisory. The staff group, some of them are parents who have students in our district. And I had one mom say that she had collected 18 vapes, right? So kids are savvy enough to not get caught in school. But if parents join in this, you know, with us, then, you know, kids have to come home. And your parent, you bought that backpack. You get to go through that backpack and the coat pockets and everything else. Um, so it's really a joint effort. It certainly is. Well, and also, I mean, if it, I it's add, a parent's responsibility. I mean, I look. It's a parent's responsibility. I mean, you know, we can't get them to support. Yeah. I mean, they're. You know, we're getting a lot of things thrown on us. It's just, you know, I just want to send a strong message out. I know we have zero tolerance, but that you know, what, whatever we can do. Mm, absolutely. You know, what we do. Once we tell the parents, I guess our hands are tied at some point if they don't. I don't think that we've had any parent to refuse their child being a part of the uh, tobacco cessation. Um, have, have we? Do we, we get? We that? had one student who adamantly refused, and um, ultimately we dealt with that with further disciplinary mm-hmm. action. But that, that was the only thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to add, where um, the health department has a grant, and they're having a uh, teen summit about vaping that's going to take place at Chesapeake College uh, March 19th, I think, and uh, 40 middle school students from each of the Mid-Shore counties. So we're currently working on that um, to see how we want to nominate. We want kind of leadership uh, students going that can kind of help, you know, in in the, the prevention of this. But um, but we'll be moving forward with that as well. But, and the, 
and make sure, I mean, you want to send the ones that aren't, but you want to send the ones that possibly Well, yes, are, so that's... Are, when I, you I'm, say leadership, the ones that are... I'm ones going, that, yes, I want to work with the counselors and administrators and have, kind of let them select who they think would be best to rep, you know, represent each, each school. Right. Uh, Ninety-seven percent of all students will avoid committing a discipline infraction that leads to an out-of-school suspension. Um, again, we're in good shape there. I think last year we were... Um, under 98% this year, or, or I mean, I'm sorry, two years ago, under 98%. Now we're at 98% from last year. Our actually, our out of school suspension rate has, has improved significantly over the past 10 years. Um, a lot of that I do attribute to our, our PBIS programs, which is uh, in place in, in every one of our schools. Um, and principals over over time have, have, have understood, you know, out of school suspension is not, is not going to solve the problem academically or. Um, I mean, clearly it needs to be a logical consequence, but we're looking for other alternative disciplinary actions. Uh, regarding attendance, goal eight says 100% of elementary schools will maintain a 95% or higher attendance rate. That's an area where we need improvement. Over the past three years, it's been under 95%, and it's been pretty flat, um, you know, 94 and a third percent. Um, so that's something we definitely need to work on. Um, Go nine, uh, hundred percent of secondary schools will maintain ninety-four percent or higher, which they have done. And again, that data over the past three years is pretty flat, but solidly over ninety-four percent. And then our overall for the entire school system has been over ninety-four percent, and really has been for for years, even with way back to No Child Left Behind, and that was the goal was ninety-four percent. We've we've consistently maintained that. So talking with the principals, one of the um problems in South County is f family vacations. Yes. And when we I'm only bringing it up because I just had this conversation with a, with a principal, Mr. Peluski and I, and, um, Captain Kelly, and uh, there's nothing we can do about it. No, and when we, we'll be talking about chronic absenteeism, which is a whole other metric, and, and that's where they're really concerned because, right. um, well, wait, actually, we can move on to that right now. Okay. Sure. Let me ask you a question to back to what uh, said. If they're absent, for vacation, but they're doing their homework, they're keeping up with their things, and I mean, then, I mean, should there be a reward where somebody ate, are out of school for one or two days? The, the state, the legislation does not account. It, if you're absent, you're absent. If you're not in the school building, right. you're right. If you're not in the school building. Even because I mean, school doctor notes, they're still absent. Unless it's a school sponsored it's event like a field trip. So, well, because I mean, some students need to be there 100 percent some all need to be 100 mm -hmm. percent but mm -hmm. if they're you know keeping up and working uh, you know and ahead teachers of the car. certainly encourage that and administrators encourage that and they do give kids work if they know that they're going to be out but the fact of the matter is that the way the law is written now absent is absent right period so but when you hear 95 <coughs> i mean that's a pretty good number because between legitimately being sick and legitimately taking a vacation not that, not i only that. brought it up because that's one thing that's out of our hands oh it is right. absolutely out of our hands but the parents should i would hope if they're going to take them on vacation make sure they're getting ahead of the, working with the teachers to yeah and that's oh yeah get, get their work and all that yeah. and keep them up but yeah vacations are out of our yeah they are and many are so part of, of uh, a, a principal is only going to prove five days if they want more it comes to my desk i look at their grades and look at their attendance um because the truth is they're going to take those those vacations but I can say whether it's lawful or unlawful, whether we approve it, but that still doesn't affect this metric, which is chronic absenteeism. So right. number 10 is 96% of students will be identified as not chronically absent. So a chronically absent student misses 10% or more of the school year. This is kind of a new metric to us. Um, when you're looking at the whole school year, the magic number is 18. Um, and now this, it does not matter if they were medically, if they missed, you know, five days for medical reasons, five days for vacation, and then other things, it, they're absent, and uh, they'll be considered chronically absent. So um, we did start really kind of working on this last year, halfway through last year, and we did make a little bit of progress. We went up, you know, over 1%. But we have a big, we have a lot of work to do in this area to get from 86 to 96 percent who are not chronically absent. So, what kind of interventions do we have for that? So, one of the things that we've done is um, our our IT department, uh, Ms. Forbes and, and Mr. Brown, have, have created uh, a tracking system where uh, counselors and administrators can quickly 
get a, a you know with a few keystrokes get a list of who are their students that are approaching who are currently chronically absent and the interesting thing about that is that is constantly changing depending on how many days you know of school we've had you know a student who has missed eight days so far this year is chronically absent yeah. but they may not be at the end of the year but we can address those kids now rather than waiting till later on and one of the ways we're doing that is we've created a letter that the counselors can generate quickly um, and have the principal sign that's that's not a nasty letter it's just kind of going out to parents saying hey you know this is something that we're tracking it's important throughout the state as well as our school system currently your child is chronically absent and if you have questions about this contact us and so it, just to let them know that it's something we're paying attention to and again some parent I mean, and some parents are upset by that um, but at least that communication is, is another piece is that they understand because it is also how how the school system and each individual school is one of the things they're rated on so I know of a community member that's actually going to a student's house that's not even her child and picking him up every day when she's taking her kids in to get the, you know to help <coughs> their parents create a habit I'm, I'm aware of that and, and I kudos to that community member who's taking the time to do that and and that is helpful because as as mr smith said you know it, it, the parents aren't going to help it, it makes our job that much more difficult parents but, hands feel you know the parents feel like their hands are tied but that's but that's where we have to do more reach you know we're, we're reaching out more to the community and the parents and uh you know any assistance is certainly any welcome. grants out there to help with parent um we used to have um jackie used to um character counts she used to have parent um education workshops um gosh who else did that we did that years ago i think my oldest daughter it has to have been 15 years ago easy maybe even almost 20 years ago to have it, it called effective effective parenting okay. workshops and just to offer to our community members people who don't feel confident enough and and putting their foot down or helping to create good habits or whatever it takes to you know to create a healthy environment for their child to go to be confident enough to go to school right so yes and, and I, I mean that's something to yeah to look definitely into. look into and i know i think the social services they have a nurturing program which is really more for i think some parents that are really struggling um but i can that would probably be my first contact to see what else there is beyond that so is there a way for you to tease out of the data those who are legitimately abusing the absenteeism as opposed to those who have legitimate reasons not to be in school. So yes, they'll be marked as as lawful or unlawful is what it comes down to. And there's there's different codes, but does, you know what it comes down to is either it's lawful absence or it's not a lawful absence. But you can be chronically absent and have every single one of your absences as lawful. Oh, my child's in that boat. I was just wondering if there's a way to tease out the kid who's hooking school rather than the child who's had doctors well and and that we do we address more from a, a punitive or a legal issue with the parents depending on the age mm -hmm. but but a student so a student um that has a a, a medical condition and they're going to be out for more than 10 days we really look to use the home hospital system so that if they're coded as as home hospital where they're um, receiving services outside of school to actually count as present so that oh, okay. wouldn't be considered an absence if that makes sense yes okay. uh, so a lot of the things we're doing regarding discipline and attendance we have the school climate teams which involves anti-bullying and, and like, as I mentioned before PBIS and that is in every one of our schools um, cultural proficiency is important um, not only with the you know achievement gaps but you know our minorities are overrepresented in referrals and out of school suspensions Youth mental health first aid, our counselors, nurses have been trained in that to, to recognize maybe some issues with students early so we can intervene early before there are discipline or attendance issues. Uh, as I mentioned, life skills at, at the middle school level uh, where they're you know, being uh, educated about you know, good decisions against risky behaviors. Uh, Arise is our alternative education. Um, and that's that's been great over the years to improve attendance and graduation rates and decreasing the dropout rate for our high school students um, and we also use that for an alternative to suspension so if uh, you know a kid does something that or a student does something where they have a five-day suspension um, they can serve at least four of them you know out there where they're not sitting at home and are actually supervised and can receive instruction keep up with their schoolwork 
a good prevention thing is get, parent gets a they get a phone call and the kid doesn't show up. Well, yes. That, that was like and then to show your child, look, I got this phone call. You can't hide from me in the school. You know, <clears throat> I mean, it was a it was an error in the administrative side, but <laughs> it was, but it worked for great pr prevention because then it's like they the child knows parents can be informed. Yes. Yes, so, and that's happening at the high schools. There's, you know, those, those phone calls go out, but the high school kids are savvy, too, and if they're not in school, then they do things to make sure the parents don't get there. Is that right, Shannon? <laughs> <laughs> um, and in conclusion, uh, we're committed to providing safe, nurturing school environment, uh, certainly based on respect, tolerance, civility, um, and that requires that we, you know, provide clear expectations for what appropriate behavior is. We communicate that. Um, that that behavior be taught. A lot of students, you know, are coming from uh, different walks of life where they, you know, what we expect is not necessarily what they've, you know, uh, have experienced. Um, and then, of course, you know, we do have our PBIS, but there are consequences for, for inappropriate behavior. Pavlov's dog, basically. Yeah. Trial and error. Any other questions or no. comments? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Six point oh three five year technology plan, Mr. Coombs. Good evening, board. Good evening. Executive evening. here. My name is Josh Combs. I'm the supervisor of technology for the county. Today, I'm going to go over kind of an overview of my department, and then we'll go into the five-year capital technology plan. Starting with my department um, in the county, we serve about 20 locations and organizations. Um, you have the schools, you have the warehouse, board office, and then we have organizations we support like Infants and Toddlers, uh, the Even Start, Juvie Center, uh, organizations like Family Support. So we're everywhere. Uh, this is just like an organization chart of my current staff. Uh, you have myself, um, and underneath me is my manager and head engineer, Chad Wright, who takes care mainly of the servers and um, managing of, of the other guys. We have two Chromebook repair technicians. They basically do the student Chromebooks at the middle and elementary schools. They do all the repairs. And we have two guys um, who take care of the high school laptop repairs, because we have about 2,500 high school machines, so their primary focus is those mobile repairs and any school tickets there. Uh, two guys who do any other standard web desk tickets that get reported to us. These are staff desktops um, and kind of software issues. Uh, Rob Cruz, who takes care of things like the cafeteria systems, teacher laptops, projects, and those kinds of um, uh, tasks. This is a snapshot of basically the, the number of technology devices. It's not everything, but it's basically every big things like the desktops, computers, the wireless box we have the school. It just kind of gives you an idea from the ratio between the number of technicians we have versus the number of devices. We're about 1,400 devices per technician. So if you break it down to what somebody would be responsible for. Industry standard is about 700 to one. So just give you an idea that how much we have to do with who we have. This does not include servers and projectors, which we're getting more involved with projectors, it seems so every year. These are kind of web desk tickets that we do and mobile repairs. We do all the staff and student desktop repairs, any software <coughs> issues, any mobile hardware repairs or software. Could be viruses, software installation, uh, parts like 
broken screens, batteries. We install technology software. We install the all the techno technology to get the computer to project. So there could be AV splitters, cable boxes, anything in between, including the projector. Uh, maintenance helps us with mounting them and get them electric, and then we take them from there. Uh, any network and Wi-Fi issues, that's us. Um, we program all the printers, get them installed, and any printer jams and things like that. At the schools, uh, everybody can report to a central point of contact, and they put it into an uh, online ticketing system that all my guys have access to so we can know what to go out and take care of. All right, so this first next slide is going to be kind of an overview of the whole five-year plan, and then we're going to go into each year in more detail. So what you have here is every year um, you have what we asked for, which was the requested, the kind of adjustment I made, and the reasoning behind it. You see a slash, that means you don't see a cut. That means I cut that out in order to get to the adjusted total and balance that we needed in order to make the plan work with the money that was given to us by the county. You'll see the budget, which is what we requested, and then what was given to us by county, and then what we had to do to make those numbers work for us. In the case of um, the first year, being this year, I went ahead and took out all infrastructure upgrades, school requests, and we just concentrated on getting the high school laptops to the students. And then we had to buy, set of brand new machine laptops for the teachers. We did refurbish laptops in order to get them replaced. Uh, we couldn't afford uh, lease or new machines, so we went that route. Which gave us a balance of 42,000, which I'm gonna use to roll over for next year, because we have big, kind of big purchases for year two. Any questions about the first year? Uh, next year, our big thing is replacing the third and fourth grade Chromebooks in the carts that we have. <clears throat> Another big thing for my infrastructure upgrades is to replace our firewall router box as part of recommendations by the auditors. They want us to go from a single point of failure firewall to a dual what's called high availability. So you basically have two boxes that are always connected. That way if we lose one, we don't go completely down. Because at this point, it's a single point. Everything has to go through that box. So we're trying to make that recommendation happen by the auditors. Um, after we replace third and fourth grade Chromebooks with new Chromebooks, uh, then what we have left are the lease payments from the middle school Chromebooks, the high school laptops. Which gives me a balance of five bucks. <laughs> I'm gonna hire you sometime. I always like these guys that do a million dollar budget and come up with five dollars left over. Right on the money. I've noticed you for two years in a row you cut the um, additional devices. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean the children don't have a device. It means you. No, no. These are additional devices just in case uh, we had a huge uh, enrollment increase. We have to buy more devices. Oh. I have some on, on that I buy at the very beginning, but it's not a lot. And I always have it there just in case we have to buy buy more. Um, luckily, it hasn't went too crazy this year. But yeah, that's kind of what I use that for. Okay. If not, we have another avenue if we have to take from if we need additional devices. We'll make it happen. Okay. Uh, year three. Um, one of the big things is our main data center here, which is our main servers, um, what's called a SAN, which is basically just a big hard drive with all of our staff files are kept on, all of our servers are kept on, all of our backups are kept on to replace that. Um, and then to look at possibly replacing the lab <coughs> desktop computers. Uh, by that point, most of the lab computers are probably reaching that eight to 10 year mark. So we're overdue at that point to get them replaced at the elementary and high schools and uh, CAD labs. They get a little bit different computers because of their high-end 3D graphics, so we buy a different desktop, particularly for those two labs. Uh, and the rest, is, again, is just lease payments um, from the previous years. Same thing. You just went two years in a row cutting out the laptops for teachers. Lease. So what instead, we were, the original plan was to make a 
do a four-year lease with brand new machines for the teachers. Since we couldn't do that, we decided to go ahead and buy a cheaper model for the first year, which means I don't have to have a lease over four years. So therefore, it's no longer in, I need that anymore. So. Okay, okay. So we just went from a lease to a purchase plan. So they still have machines, it's just, it just the way it looks like when the original plan. Year four, um, we replaced the servers at the schools. We have two at each school, main servers, uh, teacher classroom desktops, uh, the special educator staff laptops, they'll be up to be replaced with new laptops um, to continue the four or five year plan. Um, those are the big projects. The rest is just lease payments from the laptops and those school Chromebooks. And as you see, the numbers getting close. Like I said, last year was thirteen thousand. This year is ten thousand. So we're pretty, pretty tight on trying to make this work. Um, but this is kind of being in line with what we did the first, what I call the first phase, the first five years. Uh, the final year, we basically go back to repeating year one, which is replacing the high school laptops and the middle school Chromebooks. Actually, middle school Chromebooks over year four, sorry. Year four would be a big year for the high school, doing all the middle school Chromebooks, fifth or eighth. So remind me, uh, Mr. Coombs, we did the one-to-one -one initiative back in 2016? Uh, 2015, this, uh, this is the, the sixth year. 15 would have been the pilot, 16. Okay, I remember having that meeting here in this room. So do we have any of those book, uh, Chromebooks left over from back then, or have they all been re refurbished? Those have, were really bad off Okay, that, and from, so that, from that first set. What we're trying to do with the third and fourth grade is they're kept in carts, and they're still in pretty good condition. I would like to pass okay. them down to the first and second, which is not really part of the capital plan, but it gives the first and second grade Chromebooks. So then we really have almost uh, so what per year? classroom between 1 to 12. So what year would we be trying? That would happen next year. Okay. Next year. So the ones that are for the third and fourth now will be... The yes. hand-me-downs, okay. Yes. And you think the fir first and second grade teachers, they're, they're excited and ready to, ready to have it? They are ready. Pretty yeah. positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be very exciting. Yeah. That'd be great. Yes. More devices for you to have to take care of, but I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only unfortunate is they're all leased, so it's, we're going to have to put some off of the side to repair, but... Um, We've had really good success with the ones in the carts. I mean, we're talking about one or two a year that might break. The worst oh. thing we're going to have is bad batteries. Okay. So, but as, as hardware-wise, they, they, those third and fourth graders have treated them very well. Okay. So I, I don't really expect any different between the first well, and second. I guess when it goes to the carts, they're charging at night or something. We yes. Around. Mm -hmm. I think we saw that. There's actually one in each around. classroom in third and fourth. Oh. So they're just kept in the, in the cart and kids just put them back. And then what we ask is the kids to... They all have numbers on them, and then at the beginning of the year, teacher will just put the name and the number, and that kid just grabbed that same one. So you kind of know. Who's getting what? Who's getting what. And, uh, like I said, in the, in the, in the last year, like I said, we're, just, we're starting the high school laptops again, and we did the second year of the fifth or eighth grade Chromebooks, doing the renewing the lease and getting new machines. I have a question. Uh, yes, just can you review with us, Sid, what we ended up getting funded for? Or, like, we're guaranteed these money the next five years? 1.4? For sure, every year. The I commissioners mean, that, have made that commitment. They've made that commitment. That's what's on their six-year plan, yes. So okay. they've, they've got that in their, their capital budget. For the That's what year. I grabbed from their budget. They, they have right now is 1.4 being as a listed so item. Technology for the school system. Yes. Okay, great. I don't know if that means I want to get it, but that's what the list is currently in their document that I pulled. But it's in their document. Mm -hmm. Have we discussed that with them ever? Yes. Absolutely. Um, but, I mean, you south. never know what is going to happen with each budget year, but they've accounted for it. No, but, but they're aware of. Absolutely. And yes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's what I, I budgeted here today was what I saw they were going to give to us, though. Okay. So we can. I just couldn't remember because I know the first batch we had, they were in here with us telling us, and they agreed verbally to us, but I couldn't remember the and second. And, you know, they, they changed, too, so. Yes. Right. That's why we said we've had conversation. We're looking good. They've accounted for it. We we can't foretell the future, but understand mm -hmm. that everybody's aware of it. Absolutely, sir. 
Any other questions? Anybody? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, would everyone like to take a break right now? Come back at 8 o'clock and then. Is that mm -hmm. too much time? Is that all right? Okay, so. Give 10 minutes, so 5 of 8. We'll be right back. Thank you very much. Will this take place at the kitchen at Chesapeake College? No. Facility? This is going to happen this is, in This the is schools. purely within uh, our ag science program at um, Queens County High School. Mr. Stokes, which does a great job, uh, also supervises uh, the FFA program, Future Farmers of America. Um, because this would work well with um, something that I have been talking to Mr. Tolley and um, Andy Schultz about having a curriculum to gear toward um, culinary arts. Culinary arts. Yes. I mean, it, all of this applies. This is awesome. And, but it's falling under. Yes, this is a little bit different. This is, yes. This it, is a, it's a little bit different. It's not the actual uh, preparation of correct. food okay. and cooking. It's so food production, the chemicals within foods, okay, making so sure that it's safe. So more ag yeah. related. This okay. is part of that program. And Alan will have the ability to come up to Queenie and answer that. Yes, sir. Okay. The students apply for that program, and yes. would would this lead into something? That, I mean, talk to the seat of Chesapeake about leading. You know, if they've taken this course, that might be a well. These are no, they're programs. two different, kind two different, of different programs. Things. The culinary arts would hmm. be more with food prep rather than food safety. Well, it is food safety, but the processing and manufacturing, food development, it's hmm. two different things. But this would be a good foundational course. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Sure. No, where sure. Absolutely. Sure. To see if they like the coming from. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, so do you require um, a vote of the, from the board to accept this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So any other questions, comments? Do I have a motion to approve um, for a new course study, food and science and food science and safety? So moved. I have a, I have a motion. Second, and I this will be at Queen Anne's County High School, but is available for Kent Island High School students. Yes, sir. Okay. I have a motion yes. and a second. Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the new course, Food Science and Safety. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Paluski. Can I ask you one question? Not on the, um, this particular one, but sure. It, can a student take a course that is only offered at Queen Anne's from Kent Island and, let, and not be in that pathway? Can a student say that again? Can a student, a student take sees a course that is involved in this this pathway, maybe this course? Mm -hmm. Can they just take the course and not be involved in the pathway? They'd have to be involved in the pathway. Yeah, that's right. So there's the there's a whole sequence, which is also part of our, our requirement in Queen Anne's that you've got to be in a particular pathway. So and that's the whole thing because each one of these has a has a four course sequence. So the each one builds to the next course. So typically a singleton just to come in to take one course if it's not tied to your pathway. Well, this is an you can't elective if, course. You can if you're at your home school though, right? I mean, I, I, students take a pathway course because they're interested in but they're not in the pathway. As an elective? Mm -hmm. Yes, they could take it as, as an elective, but most of those students that are within that particular pathway are but we wouldn't necessarily transport them then from Kent Island to there just to do a course they like. Because okay. most of the students that are, uh, you know, coming to Queen Anne's are taking, you know, two to three right. courses. And, and typically what happens is they might be in that particular pathway, but they're also there where they can pick up a core course, like an English course mm -hmm. or a social studies course. Um, but they're still taking one of those courses down at their, if it's Kent Island as an example, um, one course, but the vast majority of those courses would be taken. Could be. I mean, a lot of students take more than than one at Queen Anne's County High School. So if they're, line, if, if we're talking a specific go, pathway. Take this course. That's what I want to clarify for you. No, but they, but if they want to be in that pathway, they right. have the ability to come up. It's it's offered to all students at yes. Queen Anne's County. Yes. I can understand not just for one, but it's yes. just a four part. But they can have the ability to come up here if they want to be in that. If they apply into that program and there's um, obviously space for that and they apply to that, yes, absolutely. 
then they that's where we get into a partial schedule where then mm-hmm. they would be transporting themselves up here be able to take you know two I just or want three to make classes. sure there's parity both and it goes both mm-hmm. ways I want what's offered at Queen Anne's yes. is Ken Island and you know we're, we're and one system I yes. know we're a small system but you know we yes. still have and we're beginning that process right now and we'll do that all the way up until June where both of the schools come April we start to look at enrollment numbers and they're talking about okay this many students are coming here what's the staffing look like but to answer your straight up to answer that question is yes they have the ability right to be able to do that what is difficult though is if they want to do that they may be inclined to do that but they don't want to go because they end up at Queen Anne's almost the whole day well, I, I understand and it's, then it's, they don't want to do that so they don't so yeah, we but, don't but, have but, but I wish they, we had the opportunity to have them at both schools I think that's what I said earlier since we're only a small school that's one of it's one of the nice things but it's one of the turn things when you're not that big you can't offer it everywhere but right. we do have the ability if they're willing sure. to make the effort we can accommodate them to right. do that that's, that's the only thing, only thing we can do yep we do it now mm-hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you for yes. clarifying that. Uh, contracts. I would like to um, enter the motions first, and then have the subsequent discussion um, on e- on each motion before we approve it. Um, I think a lot of times we would be getting ahead of ourselves and having discussion before we have the motion. So, uh, may I have a motion to for agenda agenda item uh, non public uh, tuition board uh, child care for the Strawbridge School. Uh, contract period October 7th 2019 to July 31st 2020 fiscal impact of eighty eight thousand six hundred seventy nine dollars and sixty five cents from the FY 20 unrestricted operating budget so I have a motion to move second. Uh, I have a second the motion is second any questions or comments on the motion let me read a little bit for this this is for non-public tuition for student attendance at child a board of child care for the Strawbridge School. The student attending the board of child care, Strawbridge School, transferred into QACPS with a pre-existing placement. The student requires services not available in QACPS. The funding is made available through local and MSDE reimbursement funds. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, funds. I mean, got to do what we got to do, but is this coming out of our general funds, special ed, or is this coming out of other? It says local and MSDE reimbursement. Reimbursement funds from the FY20 unrestricted operating budget. So this is another number to our special ed that we're already Correct. Okay. Yes. above. I mean, you have to do it, but we're already in trouble. Yes. Correct. Well, is this a grant? Is this a grant? No, it's, it's no from grant. Local funds as well. We do get MSDE reimbursement for our non-public. Was this was this number in the number when we transferred money last time that? Offset some, you know. No, this one has come up. No. This is this so is this, this, was, this is not in what we did last month. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, but okay. this is not part of that. Gotcha. Okay. But not. But this is something we have to do. It correct. Mm-hmm. Any other questions or comments? How on much the does MSDE provide for us for this particular? We're, we're locally going to provide that. Or is that sixty-eight thousand? There's a percentage that they pay based on the total amount of. The tuition, it, it it's once you go over three hundred percent, then they they reimburse you for portions of that. So right now we're the price tag is eighty eight thousand six hundred seventy nine dollars and sixty five cents. Correct. Our cost. Okay. Any other questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion. For the non-public tuition board of child care at Strawbridge School for the amount of $88,679.65 coming from the FY20 unrestricted operating budget. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Action item for the Board of Education. Do I have a motion to accept the Maddie Peak Elementary School gutter and downspout replacement uh, call a fiscal impact of $25,725 from the FY2020 comprehensive building assessment. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions, comments? Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, Mattapeak Ele- Elementary School has experienced water infiltrations 
issues in the gymnasium. A study was completed by Bignell Watkins Hasser to assist in remediation efforts. Although the existing gutter system around the gymnasium is sized approximately for the footprint of the roof, it was determined that the half round shape of the gutter is not adequately moving water. Replacement of the gutters will work in conjunction with the other upcoming remedial efforts. It's Mr. S Mr. Pinder. So, so I see all these pictures. Yeah, so basically we hired a company to go in there, a third party that we wanted to lay eyes on the issue we were having. Close to the three doors there um, in the gym, the past five years or so, we've experienced some warping of the gym floor. Um, we have had several contractors come out there to offer their input, um, and we've listened to some of them, but I, at this point, I thought it was a better idea with Ms. Pullen and I that we had a third party come in there to evaluate what they were seeing. Um, We've had this on the radar for a while. It's the first time that we have funding in our capital budget to do this work. Um, part of the problem, if you want to go into it, or part of the problem is the gutters, the overlapping of it, as you can see on the picture. Most of the water coming off the gutter is shooting over top of it and coming down. So we're trying to isolate one item at a time to figure out what the problem is, because even if you read the report, you know they didn't specifically identify one particular thing that was causing it. So we're trying to knock off the obvious ones one at a time to see how we're doing. Yes. Yes. And there are several other things that we'll be following up with um, and we'll keep you apprised. One of the other items is um, just door sweeps and weather stripping around all of the doors. Um, potentially looking at bigger projects with grading. There was some mention of retaining walls. Once we start getting into a major regrading of the site, then we do have to look at greater planning for drainage and also look at permitting and that type of thing. We talked about canopies at the existing doorways just to try and keep some of that watershed because the staff has noticed that during rain events where we get lots of wind in either direction, it affects a door differently and you can actually see more infiltration. And essentially, we're just getting the water right there at the doorways. It's enough to get to the wood athletic floor and that's where we've seen some difficulty um and, and we're not talking infiltration all the way across the floor no we're just talking basically right at the entrances that but you know year after year for the past three or four years i mean it you know becomes an issue and like i said we've identified this and it's the first year that we've ever had funding to actually correctly hopefully fix the problem so and this building was built in completed in 2004 so we're now looking at a 15 year old building so I think some of what we're dealing with as well is just simple erosion over 15 years we're now looking at the end of life on things like weather stripping and door sweeps and so as Mr. Pender uh, told you we're, we're looking at the things that can easily be done and quickly be done to try and remediate some of this and then as we move forward look at more of the more advanced grading projects and things that will be sure that we stop this for good. Who, who was the architect that designed this building? This was Grimm and Parker. Yes. And Parker. Yes. They did our high school. Uh -huh. Yes. They did did, they, did they have any liability in this? Yeah right. Yeah. At this point and I wish the study would have clearly said there was some sort of gutters. I mean, negligence. They, designed, they put the gutters on it. The gutters truly are sized appropriately. There's no problem in the size or the engineering. It's the architectural shape. And what they believe is happening is just that it probably looks a little prettier than it is functional. It's sized according to all of the calculations, but it's just not necessarily in really large rain events when we get the downpours that we know we can have potential flooding, it's not getting enough of the water to the gutter, it's overshooting. So it's a design flaw, but not necessarily something that was incorrect based on the design. This has been going on since the building was built. It has, it's gotten worse in probably the last five years. Um, which I think leads us to believe that it is just more of a deterioration of the conditions around the building as a whole than pointing to one specific item. I was there in 2003, I can tell you, <laughs> it was just from the design. beginning. But, but with, a grading, with the grading, wouldn't that possibly, that's a, that's the problem with the building of the building and the original grading. And that's a possibly. big bill item, so 
you think that there, anyone's liable for that? We won't know until we pursue that and we actually get into a real study of the drawings. From what this study provided us, there wasn't anything that was built incorrectly or designed incorrectly. There were some items that the school system chose not to do in the final design. One of those is a play surface that is kind of right there adjacent to the existing play surface that would have had, um, would have included more impervious or less impervious surface so we would have had better drainage there that playground for whatever reason was eliminated and the mulch that would have been underneath it probably would have absorbed some of that water was never built and we're not sure because that preceded us mm -hmm. um, why those decisions were made at that particular time but I'm sure there were good justifications but now at this point it's probably something that's hurt us a little bit didn't we put portables out there and that's why we there, there's only one portable out there. I know, but remember when we had that gym out there? Did we move that to put a portable there, or is that no. it was around the other side? No, just there's one portable there that basically uh, the music was using because they lacked the uh, amount of classrooms okay. inside. Okay. But I, I know we can't go over it, and Grimm and Parker's, uh, you know, but we, you pay them a lot of money, the percentage of that building when it's built. And I know they like a nice fancy thing, and I'm not a cookie cutter person. We should build them all the same because I'm impressed with the Sundersville to no end. I don't know if Grimm and Parker did that. But, you know, some of these guys, if they, you know, they need to tell us. They're the experts that if we take this playground away, there could be some issues. And, you know, okay, it looks better for a curved gutter, but well, we better use the, more of a box or, you know, an eight inch rather than six inch because, you know, and that's their expertise. And I know this happened well before our, your time. So, yeah, well, I think the other things that have improved. In the past four or five years, we we actually have communication that goes on amongst, you know, the engineers, our maintenance department, who are out there every single day. Hey, and, and Carla, you know, the facilities part of it, uh, this works, this doesn't work. We don't want to see this in a future school. I mean, mm -hmm. We did a great, our We did a Graysonville edition. I think that was a great job of those groups working together with Carla, you know, and, and Jim O'Donnell and those guys of hey. You know, this hasn't worked here. Let's do it this way. Or, and mm -hmm. I, I've seen a big change in that. That's, okay. that's and understanding who we have on staff that we can understand. Yeah. And this is just for the the issues of the flooding. It's not addressing, correcting the floors, the wood that's been damaged, the, the tiles. The floor has been corrected. Okay. Um, those pictures that were in there was one they we mm -hmm. wanted them to come in while everything was happening so they could. You know, assess the situation going on, but the floor has been replaced in those uh, three areas. Before we've even done the downspouts. Yeah, we didn't have to study. We had school coming up, so that's why we want to get this done. True. All right. And like I said, it's the first time we've ever had the funding to fix this part. Any other questions or comments? So I call for the vote on the approval of the contract with Tecto America to provide replacement of gutter and downspouts around the exterior of the gymnasium at Mattapique Elementary School uh, for the total amount of $25,725 from the FY2020 Comprehensive Building Assessment. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you both very, very much. Happy holidays. I'll see you. Thank you, too. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Um, 8.04 uh, policies for first read. Uh, we have policy uh, 104, code of ethics and conflict of interest policy with its regulation of 104.1. Uh, this is all for first read. Mr. Pluski. Correct, Madam President. The superintendent recommends on behalf of the uh, policy committee that the code of ethics and conflict of interest policy go out to the public for first read. Um, policy committee met today, uh, made some minor revisions uh, based upon the last um, work session, and those changes uh, are reflective here. Anyone have any questions, comments before we send it out for first read? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to send out for first read um, policy 104, Code of Ethics <coughs> and Conflict of Interest? So moved. I have, a, I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? 
Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to set out for first read policy number 104, Code of Ethics and Conflict of Interest. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much. And let me just, I want to shout out. The motion on the regulation. No, it goes with the policy. It's, okay. It all goes out for okay. first read. I, I need to thank the policy committee for all their d diligence and their patience and understanding that they have a wonderful group to work with. And we have so much on our plate, and I really appreciate every one of them. Um, policy and regulations to repeal for the second read. Um, Board of Education's policies and regulations, uh, the fire drill, you explained this the last time, sir, fire drills 212, flag display 213, interscholastic athletics 214, physical examination 216, leaving money at school 304, and payroll deductions 305. Have we had any comments? Does anyone know? No, ma'am. We've checked that. Um, and again, the superintendent recommends that those policies go for uh, second. a second read. For repeal. Correct. Any questions, comments? Uh, do I have a motion to send out for uh, these policies and regulations out for repeal for a second read? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to send out for a second read the policies and regulations to repeal that I just read off. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. Policy 310, Procurement of Goods and Services, uh, and Regulation 310.1. 3, uh, have we had any comments on this, Mr. Pluski? No, on behalf of Mr. Fister, uh, we have not had any public comment on, uh, on this particular policy. Anyone want to have any questions, comments about this policy before we set? Because this is where we are going to approve it to become our policy in 4c we, we moved it back to 25 yes we did which is in line with the county and other yes yeah anything else you want to add okay so policy for approval 8.05 do i have a motion to accept the policy 310 procurement of goods and services so moved. the motion do i have a second second any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept policy 310 with the policy regulation 310.1. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you so much. 8.06 field trip number 1791 Ken Allen High School wrestling team to Stephen Decatur January 17th, 2020 to January 18th, 2020. Mr. Pinter? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is the annual trip that uh, Ken Allen High School makes to Stephen Decatur uh, for the wrestling tournament. And basically, by the time they do the weigh-in, um, start the first round on Friday, um, they're getting done down there about 1030. Um, then they travel home an hour and a half, two hours, get back up the next morning if they were not to stay there and leave again early in the morning. Um, it's, I know we've done this the past four or five years. Um, it's, it's more efficient and better for the students. Uh, the amount is covered under the uh, wrestling uh, budget, so no students have to pay any, any money for the overnight stay. Um, and the chaperones are um, there also. Okay, yeah, I see 35 students with four chaperones. So they're tied up till 10 o'clock, time to get back to the place. It's a tight schedule. There's no, yeah. No leeway to yeah, no. go left or right. No, trust me. <laughs> and is there school it's almost in Mercy City? I understand. Yeah. But I mean, you don't need to get, you don't go at 10 o'clock in the afternoon either. <laughs> I know, I agree. Maybe okay, I so this is overnight Friday night into Saturday. Yes, yeah. ma'am. We'll come back Saturday afternoon. Or e okay. Late evening, sorry. Is this covered under school's insurance? Yes. Even though it's on a Saturday? Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Do I have a motion to accept trip number 1791, the Kennellan High School wrestling team to Stephen Decatur, January 17th to January 18th of 2020? So moved. I have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the motion to accept field trip number 1791, Kennellan High School wrestling team to Stephen Decatur, January 17th to January 18th, 2020. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. 
All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Informational items. Expenditure reports. 9.01. There is, on behalf of Mr. Fister, there, first of all, is no uh, transfer request and no transfer notice. But before you, you have the summary and detail expenditure reports for the month ending November 30th. These reports are presented for your information, so no action is necessary. Uh, a little explanation. Current expenditure levels are consistent with the same time last year. All categories have positive balances except for, as you noted earlier, Mr. Smith, the special education allocation, which we expected would become negative during the month of November. The overage can be mainly attributed to the Midshore uh, Special Education Consortium. Those dues, 110,000, which is significantly higher than it was last year, and the increase in non-public placements this year, which is about 170,000. Uh, we'll notify the county government of the negative situation, which is required by law for us to do. Uh, and we'll anticipate bringing the categorical transfer request in January um, after we've researched all of the accounts so that we can see where we can uh, transfer some funds. Thank you very much. And transfer notices, nothing? Nothing. So we have nothing to discuss so there. We're at 38,000 38, in the hole? Well, 30,000, right? But then we have more today we just Correct. authorized, so. At what point do we go and let the county know that and ask for Well, we, 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 do, we do now, So and what we'll have to do, so they'll get a letter, so they'll know that we're over, but we also, for January, after this month is done, we'll decide where we can transfer funds from. Mm -hmm. So well, what, when do we ask them for the money? Say, oh, know, I mean, it's no. not a asking for we the just money. We, we just have to transfer, transfer for this. Well, if, if we come out of category, then we got to ask them for out of category. Yeah, but all right. I'm saying is we. Not there will be a point where we have, we're way in the hole and we can't find. You know, Unless we can't. you know the hard part, and we've had these conversations before, is that you can't predict for special education when you receive students. Um, you know, you, you have to pay for it. And we couldn't also, we couldn't predict that we were going to have a $110,000 bill from ESMIC. So and that's, that, that could be looked at for our next budget because he was talking it has about to be accounted, state. And we included it in the budget that you looked at mm -hmm. for the lines. And sometime in February, March, we can get a more, I mean, as we get closer, we'll know how much, where we're short and where we're not in certain, and then we can... You get this every month, so you yeah. can see at the end well, of I can, every I can see, but I, when I see it come, I mean, everything's put to a point, but, you know, we got, we got the winter to go through, which could mm -hmm. be extra heating or not, and then we have snow, but, you know, sometime in March or April, we need to get a real good handle on it. Well, we, we know where we are, but as far as the heating goes, then, you know, we get closer to the end of the year to see if we have excess. Mm -hmm. And that might and we've used offset some of this. we've used some monies before to balance. Right now, the only one we are out of bounds with is special ed for Correct. those reasons you acknowledged earlier Correct. and the last one. Yep. 9.03 school year 2020-2021 district calendar. We are busy this because... Yep, so on November 6th, the board upheld the currently approved uh, district calendar for 2021. That calendar had an error that needed to be corrected, and it was corrected. The left side of that calendar document showed the correct days off for Thanksgiving break, Wednesday through Friday, November 25th through 27th. The right side of the calendar document showed those days uh, that the schools and central office would be closed, but it also showed November 26th, which is Thanksgiving Day, that elementary and middle schools would be closed half day for grading. That was a typo error that did not get deleted, and we didn't catch that. So we fixed that. It is posted correctly on the website. Just wanted to acknowledge that publicly. Thank you very much. You're um, community, community participation, public comment, second round. Anybody? Okay. Future meetings, uh, December 18th, 2019, school board work session, January 8th, 2020, school board meeting. Uh, for a complete list of our meetings, check on the website. Does anyone else have anything they would like to add to the end of the meeting? I would just say check because during January and February we might have additional workshop sessions that we've talked about that will be posted, but there, we usually have a regular meeting and a work station, but we look like we have an extra one or because two. Because of the budget. Right. We, we, yes, we had... Um, Try to add one. We're, tra we're thinking about adding an extra work session in there just because we have so much work to yeah. do, if that's okay with you. That's I generally gonna, what happens. I was going to ask you. 
later on. Definitely. Um, okay, so we're all good with that. Everyone, anyone else? Any extra? All good? That's awesome. Thank you all very much, and I thank you again for attending. Um, I have a motion to close our open session. So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to adjourn our open meeting. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. All those say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much. Have a pleasant evening.